beer out. Are you guys enjoying the beer so far? <laughs> well, this is the man you need to thank, and he's going to be talking about an official Adobe user group. You guys will be talking about all sorts of Adobe technologies, including in September a meetup with HTML5, which I'm super excited for. But uh, tell me a little bit more. You've got some great guests coming in, creative director of AOL. Tell me about what it's going to be like. Yeah, sure. So. Uh, we're an Adobe user group here in town. We meet up like once a month. Uh, you can find us at meetup.com slash Adobe web. And so we have a couple things coming up. Like you mentioned in September, we have an HTML5 advertising meetup. Uh, we have two guests coming into town. The first is Corey Hudson. He's the creative director at AOL. Right. Uh, and the second is going to be John Percival. He's a senior technologist at Point Roll. And so they're going to kind of go through, you know, the shift to HTML5 and advertising. They're going to talk about a lot of the, the um, specific requirements a lot of the, uh, the technical requirements. Um, so both of them lead teams of, of designers and developers. And so it's going to be a nice deep dive into that. And then actually in August as well, uh, Garth uh, Braithwaite, or Braithwaite is going to be here to talk about uh, Topcode IO. He's an experienced designer with Adobe. And so Topcode is like a, a UI library. Uh, for for web and mobile. Okay, so is, is it all programming stuff, or anyone teach me how to like take pimples off my face with Photoshop or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, so our meetup does occasionally have design stuff as well. Our last one was with uh, Renan Erickson, another another Adobe employee, and so he ran us through a lot of the new Creative Cloud updates, uh, including some of the smart filters. Okay, well we're looking forward to it. So everybody check it out, meetup.com forward slash Adobe Web. Thank you for coming out. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, I like the hand, the <laughs> finger. All right, thank you. Very much. Appreciate it. Ethan, this is our former root beer sponsor. We are happy to have you back. And today, <laughs> it is true, you really were the root beer sponsor. So he brought some today again. Yeah, you, you look pretty short. Is it be sacrilegious if you sat on this, or is it? Scoot that under you. We'll get you up a little bit higher. It's okay. good. It's a good cause. You're going to be a greater entrepreneur than him. Just wait. All right, Ethan. So tell us about uh, this big V2V launch you have of your new app. Um, my new app is called Bargument. Uh, I have a sample page here. What it is is you type in a title and a fact that you want to prove to people <laughs> and you type it in and you hit enter and it pulls up a page that looks like a wiki page and this is this is uh, our example Japanese martial arts the Japanese have a secret martial art where they uh, do bow and arrow fights on top of ostriches <laughs> this is awesome. all right so who's so tell me who's the app who's the app aimed at who do you who, who could benefit the most from this anyone who wants to uh, prove something to another whether it be for a bet for bragging purposes or anything that you want to feel good about yourself, you can say, this is why I'm right. right. And, and, and in a bar argument, right, yes. I, can, I can always win with this, right? Yes. Because it's, it's weighted towards did, yep. did you say right? a bar argument? Yeah, it is bar exactly argument. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, and then, so tell us about uh, Lazy Husband. That's been one of your big apps. You've got tons and tons of press about it. In fact, um, you, were even, you were even recently in the Weekly Review Journal, which I think everybody here is red. So tell us about uh, how everything's going with your other apps. Uh, it's going really well. Um, as I said, I'm releasing it uh, B2B. I um, just did an interview at the Las Vegas Review Journal. It's about Lazy Husband, how I got here, and um, how the community of Vegas Tech helped. And uh, my pitch talk at uh, B2B is also titled Never Too Young, Build a Startup with Your Kids, and How a Community Helped how I learned how to code, how I got here, and how I'm releasing another app. That's true. Yeah, and you really are an inspiration for a lot of people. So I think uh, it's really awesome that you're part of the community, and thanks for coming to talk about it. Appreciate it. Yeah, good job. All right. We got big shoes in the back, too. Yeah. So speaking of B2B, which Ethan is going to be launching at, we have Gabe here to talk about that. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's getting close, right? I mean, uh, it seems like just yesterday we are at South by Southwest as a community. And uh, now three weeks away, it's South by Southwest V2V, the, the inaugural one. And it's awesome because we have great, not only a lot of people coming into the city to see what we're doing, but we have great people like Ethan and Rick who are going to be presenting. And we also have a lot of other local people that are acting as mentors. And then, of course, uh, Tony Shea, who will be our opening keynote on Monday night for the inaugural V2V. So we're super yeah, excited. Great, yeah. yeah, three weeks away. And uh, 
things are going to get crazy. We're going to be doing some activations downtown. We're going to bring be shuttling people downtown for an activation, which is basically a party. It's a, that's <laughs> conference talk for party. Um, then we're also going to be doing a, a film screening at Brendan Palms Theater. And then we're going to be doing multiple music showcases uh, downtown on multiple nights. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for not only us as a community to flex our muscle in terms of what we're building here as a tech community, um, but I think the one thing I want to stress is that it isn't just for tech people. If you're in the music vertical or you're in the film vertical, uh, V2V is really a convergence of all those tracks. So check it out, at, you know, sxswv2v.com. If you're in those verticals, you're an entrepreneur, you're a hustler, you're just trying to get ahead, uh, this is a great opportunity for you to meet some great people in an intimate setting. So. Great. And then what are expectations looking like at this point for it? Yeah, I, I think uh, initially Initially, you know, it's uh, inaugural, right? So it's kind of hard. We don't have any data points to really point to, but we're at this point we're very optimistic that we'll have anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred attendees, which is great for a first year. Obviously, it's happening at the Cosmopolitan, um, but we're also working with Downtown Project to make sure that we highlight what we're building down here. Um, and then obviously we want to you know show the rest of the community the city of Vegas so that's the exciting say, bit yeah. is actually getting people out here and they're actually gonna see us and notice us right I, I think that's the amazing thing because this is the one opportunity we have to get these you know CEOs co-founders from you know arguably very successful startups to the city who haven't been here already right. you know we've got Miha Baldwin and we've got you know obviously we have some local talent too that's participating with Frank Gruber and Tech Cocktail so I mean a lot of good things are happening um, and we're super excited and uh, no sleep until V2V. <laughs> yeah, but well, he did a great job at South by. So thanks for that effort. Thank you. And we're looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. We'll see you yeah. guys there. Good. All right. We are back into the event section. So anybody, do we have any crafters in the audience? Anybody crafty? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Good, Dylan. Dylan. Pavel. Awesome. Well, <laughs> if, if you are actually a crafty person or if you want to get into crafting itself, so that's everything from sewing to embroidery to final cutting, and there's, we actually have a loom here as well, get yourself down to Sin Shop on the 30th of July, which is craft night for us. Now, that happens every Tuesday night, so if you miss that one, definitely come to the next one. You'll be coming and hanging out with other people who work on crafts, and you never know, you might learn a thing or two about a discipline that you've never actually tried before. So get down there again. That's on the 30th of July, and it starts at 6 p.m. and goes through till 10 p.m. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be fun. What about afternoon crashes? Anybody get those? Like 3 o'clock after lunch? Anybody get tired? I yeah. totally do. Really I'm always good. like eating chocolate and coffee and all sorts of awful things at 3 p.m. <laughs> well, if you actually don't want to eat lots of chocolates and that kind of thing, because it's just going to lead to another crash, you can get down to work in progress. Aaron Saris is going to be taking a yoga session from 3 to 4 p.m. Now, this happens every Wednesday. So if you get to that hump day and you're just like, I can't do this anymore, get yourself to that session. She's going to take you through a whole yoga routine for an hour. And if you don't know where work in progress is, it's on 6th Street in downtown, which is really cool. So it's a good opportunity to check out the venue as well. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but every once in a while when we're kind of trying to make this company work, you want to step back and have some time to reset. So um, I'd like to talk, talk about the Sunday Reset Project, a chance to kind of do that each month for the whole community. So the Sunday Reset, reset Project has been enormously successful in Vegas. It's run once a month. Uh, the next one coming up is going to be on August the 4th, and it goes from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, 10 a.m., sorry. We don't, <laughs> we're not going to keep you that long. Uh, and the Reset Project is about coming in early and doing some exercise, some meditation, some stretching, and some eating. So the exercise when you first come in is either a walk or a run. Now, a hot tip, I would say go for the walk because there's a lovely man called Paco who we're interviewing tonight, yeah. and he takes you on the walking tour, and you will get a whole history of downtown as you're walking around. So it's definitely something you don't want to miss. The run, I'm sure, is really cool, but I think that's a little extra special. Straight after the run, you go into a stretching routine, some meditation, and then there's going to be some really awesome top chef prepared vegan meal for you afterwards. Now, the tickets are only $15 if you buy them uh, pre-sale, and you can get them on Ticket Cake. That's a good way to reset. <laughs> All right, Adam, so tell us about Coupla. Got more events coming up, huh? Absolutely. So, a Coupla, just a reminder, like, we are focused on creating the most amazing experiential dates that you can have with your partner. And, like, these are dates that you're going to talk about in, like, six months or in a year from now. And we have two of those coming up. One of those we're working over with Las Vegas Distillery. So you'll actually get to do a VIP tour of the distillery. You'll get to check it out. Then you'll actually help barrel whiskey. So you'll actually help oh, them yeah. with that. Uh, and they're calling it a special cupola whiskey. 
And uh, then, of course, we actually have to sample all of the alcohols there. That is a requirement of doing this. So we'll be sampling all of the alcohols, okay. and then actually uh, every each couple will get to choose one of the spirits to take home, take a bottle oh, of it home. Oh, that's cool. So it's an awesome date night. It's an experience that was custom created for, for our couples. So that's a date you're going to talk about in six months. And then the next one we have coming up after that, it's a sushi and sake pairing uh, over at Yonaka Sushi. And Yonaka is a great new oh, sushi restaurant. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah. They're awesome. So actually, one of the cool things is every week they get a box of fish from Japan. They don't know what they're going to get, but they make their specials based off of what fish they get shipped to them. So these are like amazing chefs. They've had great reviews, and they're doing bringing in a, a sake dis, um, a sommelier that's going to be pairing all with all of the meals and creating a five-course meal with five sakes. Uh, $95 a couple, you know, for the whole thing, which is cheaper than dinner in a movie if you it stop totally and think is. about it. And another amazing experience that you'll get to talk about for six months, a year, and how learning how to pair and do this. Uh, really successful last time we did something similar with uh, Yonaka, and so we're really excited to do that again. Fabulous. And how can people get tickets, or do they pre-register for this? I'm not good at this promoting thing, am I? I totally <laughs> dropped the ball on it's that. It's really cool. I'm helping you Well, there's, there's two easy ways. You can go to coupla.co, um, uh, .co, just a reminder, if everyone wants to go to .com, not as cool, to coupla.co, of course. <laughs> Drop that down. Yeah. Seriously. And then, or you could go just straight to Ticket Cake. We, uh, we, of course, use Ticket Cake, because what better vendor to sell tickets than with what Ticket Cake? better vendor? That's a fact. Yeah, it's, it's scientific, actually. So <laughs> right. um, that's the easiest way to get tickets. All right, looking forward to it. So everybody check out a couple events and take your boyfriend or girlfriend. Make or it, both. Make it a thing, yeah. Because you can't go by, even single people can't go. Don't forget, that's part of the oh. couple of deal. That's the couple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dylan, 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 you can be so my date. No, we can. Sad. Don't tell my wife, but you can be my date. That's what we got to do, start hooking people up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, who's going to go with Dylan? If I can get Joe we'll and Party Line app to yeah, make some more couples for me, it'll really help out. Thank you. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right, that's you, Paco. because our next guest is an urban historian who was born in Las Vegas. He holds a bachelor degree in anthropology from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. He curated major historical collections at the Liberace Museum, the Neon Museum, the Hispanic Museum, the Nevada and Las Vegas News Bureau, photo and film archives, and probably 15 others that we couldn't fit on this page. And he served on the boards of the Nevada State Site of Historical Association, and he currently sits on the City of Las Vegas Arts Commission as an, and is employed as the culture curator at Zappos.com. So please put your hands together for the one and only Paco. Thank you for coming out. I'm excited. Okay. So we know. <laughs> yes. Mark it on. Okay, so we know you can talk about all sorts of cool stuff, but for our audience, we have a lot of entrepreneurs, so I sure. wanted to keep it focused on people, specific people that people might not know of, that actually helped form downtown Las Vegas throughout history. Oh, there were so many. I think uh, the, the first one that comes to mind is uh, Senator um, uh, William Andrews Clark. He uh, He's the namesake of Clark County. Uh, he was this uh, copper baron that actually founded Las Vegas in 1905. He was a ruthless guy. I mean, this guy was a trip. His daughter just died two years years ago. Uh, and the, the fact that someone was actually the first generation of Las Vegas just died two years ago is pretty remarkable. She was 106 years old. Her name was uh, Huguette Clark. She died as one of the wealthiest people, one of the wealthiest women in the United States when she passed away. And it's quite controversial, sadly. Um, her accountant or attorney actually tried to embezzle a lot of money from her. Um, she lived the last 30 years in a hospital in New York. I, I think it was uh, Mount Sinai Hospital in, uh, in New York City. And, and uh, you you know, the fact that Las Vegas, that tells you a lot how young the city is. And her father did so much to actually create the railroads in the West. Uh, another person that really comes to mind, uh, looking back, is Mamie Stalker. Okay. Mamie Stalker was the, she was the first person in the state of Nevada in 1931 to actually hold, hold a gaming license. And this is someone who, you know, a lot of people are like, a woman holding a gaming license back there. And actually, yeah, absolutely. She held, uh, right. she owned the Boulder Club and, and the, the North 
Northerner. I mean, these are some amazing hotel or little casinos here in, in town. Yeah, it's riddled with entrepreneurship. I Absolutely, guess, huh? yeah. Las Vegas is a is a byproduct of, of the expansion of the West. Uh, Nevada is a very entrepreneurial state. I mean, it really, it's 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 a place for survivors. If you can't survive in Nevada, you can't survive anywhere. Okay. <laughs> you know, so good. Well, and so how's the culture sort of formed around these entrepreneurs in the sense where other entrepreneurs can have an advantage? You know, I, I think when we look at, at Las Vegas uh, historically, it is a place of survival. I mean, if you can survive in the desert, you really survive anywhere. I mean, it's a city that shouldn't even be existing. I mean, it, there's enough water in this community to sustain a small population, but there isn't enough water in this community to sustain two million people. So we are a byproduct of the 21st century technology, whether it was the, the advent right. of the railroads, whether it's air conditioning, the damming of Hoover Dam, and the creation of Lake Mead. It's really... Uh, a survivor city, and through the uh, Nevada, we, when we look at the um, at the history of this of this state and all the ghost towns that exist, you know the few cities that do exist in Nevada, whether it's Reno, Carson City, Elko, Las Vegas, these are cities that have survived uh, in arid climates. Uh, you know, through the boom and bust of mining. You know, Nevada is one of the largest producers of gold in the world, and mining has been a, a, a key part of of uh, the economy. In this, in this state. Also, we had no choice but to actually legalize gambling in 1931 because we didn't have enough uh, state government to actually regulate. Oh, it wasn't just like a, like we want to. It was no, more of a like, necessity, necessity to keep things. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Sense, gambling. We, we, uh, we legalized the, the quickie marriage here, the quickie divorce, which <laughs> which brought a lot of people here. You <laughs> could, Are you talking about the drive through marriages and no, stuff like no, that? No, or like, you're a quickie divorce? What's the quickie that? divorce, basically okay. what Nevada did in the 30s was legalize the quick divorce. You could get, uh, you can come to Nevada, set up a residency in six weeks, oh, and yeah, get divorced. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened in a lot of the resorts here in, in Las Vegas is that you'd had all these big movie stars coming in from L.A., get, set up oh, residency geez, really? here, live in the hotels for six weeks, and get divorced. Wait, so, so, so tell me about some of the drama. I mean, like, we, we have mobsters, you got Elvis, and I guess even this evil Clark guy, right? or this ruthless Clark Ruthless. Guy. I wouldn't say I evil, mean, yeah. He's a, he's, a, he's a byproduct of the Gilded Age, you know, and, yeah. you know, he's a copper baron. This was a time when no one paid taxes, and, and these guys made f huge fortunes. I mean, we're talking about Clark, Vanderbilt, uh, you name it. These guys were here to make a lot of money, but they also invested a lot in their communities. So, you know, especially in places like New York, where you have the, the, the Morgan Library, and you have uh, Guggenheim, and all these guys. I mean, I, a couple of years ago, in my search for Huguet Clark, and of course I didn't find her, and she had passed away about a year later after I went to New York, I went to her father's tomb. I mean, you have to understand the uh, Woodlawn Cemetery, or, or is it Forest Lawn or Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx is really a, a, an amazing place. I mean, it is funereal architecture at its best here in the United States. And this is places where the, literally these guys built pyramids to themselves. Right. You know, That's and true. Clark's tomb is one of the biggest tombs in in the cemetery. And he's in good. He's in a, in, a, in very good company. He's up there with a, you know a Sears, with a Woolworth, with a J.C. Penney, all these guys that are buried out there. So it's pretty remarkable. Oh, so, so tell me about this specific story before Tony was involved with downtown. Like, how did it go through this boom and, and kind of kind of hit this downslope? You know, downtown has always been the historic center of the city, and we um, there was no strip at that time. I mean, the strip was basically Highway 91 to L.A., and those that were brave enough to drive their cars from L.A. to Vegas would come down what would be eventually what was Fifth Street. Oh, because there were so few gas stations and things? So like few it's gas like, yeah. stations. People would actually, if you talk to some of the old-timers, they would actually put water bags in front of the radiators to keep the engines cool so they wouldn't um, overheat. Yeah. It was brutal. I mean, yeah, even yeah, yeah. I, even my, my parents and I, when we did the drive to go to Disneyland back here, I remember my, my dad's 79 Thunderbird uh, overheating on the uh, on the Baker grade coming back yeah. into Vegas. It was brutal. Um, you know, eventually the reason why the strip developed was there was uh, cheaper taxes um, in the county rather than in the city. A lot of people don't realize that the most, the, the bulk of the Las Vegas Strip is actually in Clark County and not in the city of Las Vegas itself. Oh. So anything, oh, and we're in Las Vegas right now? We are in okay. Las Vegas. We're right in the middle of the city. And, and anything south of the stratosphere is Clark County. So oh, all right. the major hotels, yeah, that. Paradise, oh, yeah. Paradise, you know. And so you um, anything down there is, they, they, they're not subject to the same tax 
taxes that we are here in the city. Gotcha. And you can thank uh, some of the uh, the mobsters back in the day for for uh, making sure you that they. Yeah. yeah, we do because they're the ones who went to the state legislature and made sure to create the township uh, concept, which is the township of Paradise and Winchester, so that the city of Las Vegas couldn't annex those properties and that land. And look, what happened to the mobsters? Did they just like? I mean, are mobsters still around? Like, just business people now, or is it like did the whole culture just die because it didn't work? Or? I don't know. Like, how did it? I, I could say no comment. Because you know, you're worried but... about getting killed. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I would say, there... you know, what's interesting is that I, I went to school with a lot of their kids. Okay. And, you know, growing up here, you, you, you knew who they were. And uh, do I say, do I think they're, they're st are they, they don't have the influence that they've had before. They're still around. Gotcha. Um, there's also a different kind of mafia, per se, in the city. Um, you, you have a lot of, of uh, different cultures that have come into the community and have kind of infiltrated. But they do exist. Uh, you know, yeah. that's not well, I mean, and part, you know, part of breaking the rules kind of is sort of entrepreneurship. So I can see how it's like just kind of the bad side of it but um so tell me what else can we uh like walk around and see that could like tell us a story i mean is there anything that was like almost going to get built that didn't like any kind of interesting things about fremont or fremont east well, Fremont Street, back in the in the late 1950s, early 1960s, they the, the whole city realized that they were being outcompeted by the Strip, and so they they had to do things, set in motion certain uh, things that would help them uh, compete against the Strip. And one of the craziest things that they did, and if you walk up and down Fremont Street, uh, in particular the back ends of the hotels, such as the Four Queens and and, the, and uh, places like Binion's and the the Fremont, uh, they have these parking garages. Right. So one of the first things that they did was they actually created what was known as the Casino Center con concept. They renamed downtown Casino Center, hence the reason why there is 3rd Street is, is Casino Center. Okay. And they, uh, or is it 2nd Street, excuse me, 2nd, 2nd or 3rd, anyway, I figured it out. Um, but they created this concept, and then about a mile north of the Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign, they created a massive sign that said um, downtown Casino Center uh, 15 minutes away. And so it was a sign that was much larger than the Welcome sign. We actually had one of these signs at the Las Vegas, or one of these photos at the Las Vegas News Bureau. It didn't last for very long, um, sadly, because it was such a cool sign, uh, but it was much larger than the welcome sign. And the welcome sign is actually quite small in comparison. And the city did as much as they could to encourage people to actually drive the extra 15 minutes to come away from the Strip and actually go to downtown Las Vegas. And another thing that they did, a really sneaky thing that they did, uh, instead of attempting to, to tear down buildings and uh, rebuild the, uh, the Fremont Street area, they took all the buildings that were uh, built in the 1920s and 30s, and they put facades on them. And one of the best examples of those facades is the Golden Gate. In 1989, the Golden Gate finally decided to take the facade down, and they exposed the original building that was there. Now, the Golden Gate's the oldest uh, continuously operating hotel in Las Vegas. It was oh, built really? in 1906. Uh, kind of weird what they did with the, the Golden Gate. They decided it was originally opened as the Hotel Nevada in 1906. Then it changed names to the South Segev, which South Segev is Las Vegas spelled backwards. In, 19, in the late 1950s, they renamed it the, the Golden Gate in honor of the San Francisco earthquake that happened in 1906. Really weird. <laughs> yeah. And they kept the name. But if you go down on Fremont Street right now, especially at Binion's or the old Pioneer Club, which you see Vegas Vic, if you take those facades or those neon spectaculars, as they're called, all the original buildings are still there. You will see the Boulder Club still there, which was built in the 30s. You will see the, um, the Apache, the Hotel Apache. You will see Beckley these old buildings still there. So you could actually kind of restore a lot of Fremont Street if you just take the facades down. Okay, so um, I mean, this is fascinating stuff. What, like, first of all, I want to talk about places that we can continue this conversation. Like, where where are the museums that you recommend people check out? For the, a lot of us have just moved here, so. Well, Las Vegas has a very unique um, vernacular, uh, especially historically. The Mob Museum is one of the best places to go and see it. It's in an old building that was built in 1933. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, the fact that they took this old surplus building from the federal government in 2004 and they turned it into the Mob Museum. Originally, they turned it an art museum, they called it the postmodern and all this, um, is a great place to actually see a lot of, of that, that crime history that Las Vegas yeah. um, had. You know, even though Las Vegas wasn't built on that originally, uh, it nonetheless it kind of infil infiltrated because of legalized gambling. Another great place to see um, a lot of our, our vernacular history is uh, uh, the Neon Museum. Right. Neon Museum, you can see all the old signs. You see, uh, when I worked at the Neon Museum, we actually, one of the, the things that we had acquired was the old La Concha 
motel lobby, which we actually was located just south of the um, of the Riviera. They cut it up into eight pieces and actually physically moved it down Las Vegas Boulevard at two in the morning, nice. yeah. uh, and then they reassembled it. So crazy. Okay, so it's not like um, you guys are going to stop doing the tours of Zappos in a week or so, I hear, but yes. then you're going to start the move down here. Um, October, I know it's kind of a long ways up, but do you kind of have an idea of like what people can expect once the tours open back up with the new campus? Oh, it's magical. Magical? We're, we're, yeah. we're, we're, uh, okay, so you guys have the bar. Are you going to do the bar and stuff? Like I hear people talking about it in, inside the new Zappos building, which is there, the old jail. And like kind of, there would be some fun stuff in the building. Right? There is. I mean, Zappos like, is just history. a fun place. Yeah. It's really remarkable. Yeah. I mean, curating their, their um, historic archive is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've worked with archives that, that are hundreds of years old, or 100 years old, I should say in the hundreds. But then I come over to Zappos, and they've been, uh, you know, they're a 14-year-old organization, and they have a fascinating corporate archive. If you've ever taken a, a tour of the Zappos facility, it's really amazing. I mean, the celebration of culture uh, is is yeah. really awesome. So you're going to continue that, and then will you also gonna... walk around downtown, or is it, the tour going to be all just in the building? Yeah, no, we've got some surprises up our sleeves, okay, so surprises. I don't want to let those go. Okay. Yeah, but but when, cool. when you get the surprises all lined up, sometime in October, the people just be going to Zappos.com and then somewhere on the bottom or something, there'll be a link where they can Absolutely. sign up for the tour and do that. Yeah, just click on tours all the way at the bottom of Zappos.com. Okay. And until then, you guys can check out uh, Paco's actual blog, which is always being updated at LasVegasArtsAndCulture.com. And you can also follow him on Twitter at LasVegasPaco. So give him a big round of applause. We appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Good story. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this thing up and get you guys going. We're gonna quickly jump over to Susan, who's gonna end the show by asking one of our random, crazy, weird questions. This way, <laughs> uh, we have Richard. He's from the Adobe Meetup User Group, actually the beer sponsor for tonight, which is super cool. Richard, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, Richard Hoppus. And if you had a pet unicorn, what would you name that unicorn? Well, at Zappos, we actually have like a stuffed pink unicorn. Uh, named Bruce, so Bruce. I have actually seen Bruce, he's very cool. Very cool name for a unicorn. And if Bruce was to have a super special secret power, what would that power be? <sighs> farting rainbows, I think would be the best superpower ever. <laughs> and why farting rainbows? For, for unicorn, I mean, it, I don't know. It just, it would be cool. <laughs> be spreading joy throughout the land. Thanks Richard, thanks for watching, see you next week. Yeah.